How disappointing. Okay. Uh, uh, so I've been having problems myself. <laughs> I had to drive up to Austin to get my computer repaired, and uh, and it died on me again last night, and I broke my toe, and it's just been one of those weeks. So, uh, but we've been working. Uh, so San Jacinto, San Jacinto Battleground is at the north end of Galveston Bay, at the juncture of the Houston Ship Channel or Buffalo Bayou and the San Jacinto River. And uh, by accident, I guess you could say, is where the the Texian Army. Uh, met up with uh, Santa Ana's army out of Mexico, and uh, they had a little tiff that is basically why Texas is part of the U.S. instead of Mexico. Um, so it's a very important area. Uh, it's been a state park since, I want to say, 1903. Uh, it's never been plowed. Uh, it has been grazed and um, has had other things done to it. But it is uh, fairly unique as far as remnant prairies go in that it's had a lot of much different management history than most of the other remnant prairies in this area. <clears throat> so I was uh, hired by the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department as the State Parks Natural Resource Coordinator in 2005. But the restoration activities at this park uh, actually began in the late 1980s under David Riskin, my supervisor, former supervisor. He retired this August. I'm not sure that life can continue without him, but he's been, uh, David has actually been a real mover and shaker in terms of conservation in the state of Texas. So I'm really sad to see him go. Uh, and then my predecessor, Ted Hollingsworth, uh, has also been involved in restoration at this park since uh, the early 1990s. <clears throat> but in order to restore this area, it was in, uh, I guess you could say, fairly not the best condition. Uh, when, um, when David came on board with the Parks and Wildlife Department in the mid-70s, uh, the idea of conservation in state parks was um, really in its infancy. And what I mean by that, state parks were kind of viewed as an area that are, it's really for recreation. Uh, but as Texas has developed, and David had the foresight to know that this was going to occur, uh, when we first started talking about state parks, they were an area to come recreate. If you wanted to see nature, you just stepped out in your backyard, you know, the 30s, the 40s, the 1950s, 100 years ago. Well, nowadays, state parks contain some of the very few areas left in the state that are in, in their natural condition. And unlike wildlife management areas, we in state parks, our goal is really to maintain the natural portions of the park as they, as they would be uh, prior to European settlement. Basically a snapshot of what we would consider natural conditions. Um, so we're not managing it for specific species. We're not managing it for strictly for recreation. We're managing it for I guess you could say it's natural state. The idea being that we're trying to conserve as much of the fauna and flora as we can. And because we're not omnipotent, we figure the best way to do that is just try to restore nature to the way it was when we first saw it. <clears throat> At this park, because it is such an important historic site, uh, we have two goals. And thank goodness they kind of match up with one another. This is Jaime's photo here. Um, uh, so we're trying to restore this battlefield to the condition it was at the time of the battle in 1836, which also essentially lines up with pre-European settlement. So our goals are in sync there. Uh, why do we want to restore it to the way it was in the battle? Well, you can see Jaime took these photos of these guys sneaking through the grass. These are reenactors. Every, every year on San Jacinto Day, April 21st, I think. Am I going to be killed? Is it 22nd? It's 21st. We'll edit it. Thank you. Um, so April 21st, they have a reenactment of the battle. And when you, before us natural resource types came onto the scene, the battlefield was being maintained like a Civil War battlefield in the east would be, basically a mown lawn where people would come and have picnics and stuff. And even prior to the 70s, they'd bring out their metal detectors or their shovel and dig up and haul away artifacts. Um, so that also has changed. But it was being maintained as a mown lawn. And... Um, 
when, you stu when visitors would stand out there, they'd say, okay, here's where the Texas Army camped, there's where the Mexican Army camped. I don't get it because they're like looking right at one another, you know. But as we've let the prairie come back, you can understand that, oh, actually there was like head high grass between them. There were dips and swales. There was a lot of stuff blocking the view from of one party to the next. Uh, so we're also trying to restore the prairie for that reason. Um, how do we know what the prairie used to look like? I mean, it was being mown very short. Um, we have, uh, unlike a lot of sites, we've got a plethora of resources for this site to know what it used to look like. We have uh, soil maps. We have historic aerial photos starting in 1930. We have actual still photos from 1870s on um, because this was, this was the place to be. You know, This was where Texas began. So even in the 1800s, people were coming and visiting. We've got... Uh, maps of the battlefield that were done drawn by the by the uh, veterans of that battle shortly after the battle and these were maps that were done um, not with uh, good quality survey instruments but by people pacing off uh, from one area to another so these are pretty good battle maps and we can actually um, I have actually uh, using computer software laid overlay those battle maps to present day topographic and aerial photos and they line up actually really well and um, the natural features of the battlefield were very important played a very very important role in the battle so that they were drawn in on these maps so we know exactly where the clumps of trees were you know we know where the open prairie was we know where the marsh was all those things were noted on these maps and there are historic descriptions the people who fought in the battle kept diaries and they talk about picking off the Mexicans hiding in the tall grass, for example, or sneaking along a wood line, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, and then also, going out to the site, you can see, you can find traces. There, there still are remnants of the native prairie vegetation. And the different types of veg uh, plants that we see, the different species, give us cues as to, oh, this was this sort of prairie, this was that sort of a prairie. <clears throat> And again, I always show this slide when I give a talk, so excuse me if you've seen it for a hundred times, but I want to remind everybody, here's Houston, here's West Bay, Galveston Bay. Houston sits on top of a delta, of a river delta. Okay, not like a, the bird's foot delta out in the Gulf, but where the Brazos and the Colorado have come down, they hit that flat coastal plain, and then they spread out and have many, many different mouths. And this has shaped... Um, uh, what our coastal prairie is, and San Jacinto is definitely in the realm of coastal prairie. So, and here's an old, <clears throat> an old photo from Google Earth. This is a 44 photo, I think. And you can see, here's Clear Lake, <clears throat> and you can see the forests and Armand Bayou here. Um, but what I want to show you is this little line of ponds and this white, it's actually high sandy soil with Mima Mounds, the little sand dunes that are out on the prairie sometimes, contrasting with these dark black gumbo Gilgai soils. We have two totally different kinds of prairie here, switch grass, grass gama grass, little blue, brown seed, Indian grass, big blue stem up here in the higher, lighter textured, sandier soils. Um, and these are a result of this being a, a deltaic formation where the old rivers used to run. They were throwing sand out over their banks, so you have these uh, relatively loamier soils um, versus between the fingers of, of these uh, river channels, you've got the areas where the flood waters would just sit and slowly uh, dry up, and there you have these thick clay soils. And by understanding the geology of the area, I can take that, I took that to San Jacinto and said, okay, look, here's where we have this kind of soil this is, this is the prairie that would normally be on here. Here's this other kind of soil. We'd have a different sort of a prairie. And that's helped guide our restoration, especially when it comes to plant introductions into the prairie, because we have lost species at this site, and we, so we are actively reintroducing them. And this is the Nature Conservancy's Nash Prairie. This is a topographic, a very accurate topographic map made of that area. And you can see here's the, the purple is lower. You have this old river channel, you have the, high, the green is higher, you have the sandier banks along that. And if I really zoomed in, you could even see the little pimple mounds all over the place there. Um, other resources, this is a, an old 
uh, SCS Soil Conservation Service publication on Gilgai soils. Um, it says this is an aerial photo showing Gilgai. You can't see it, but this is uh, the, if you were up close, you would see that this picture shows um, the land being a, a matrix of, of little low depressional ponded areas and then higher areas surrounding it, just all uh, pockmarked all over the place. That's the Gilgai, which is the high shrink and swell soils you see in these black gumbo clays where the soil shrinks and swells and that shrinking and swelling mounds some areas up and makes dips in other areas. And this is a real typical prairie type we have in this area. <clears throat> it's actually not an aerial photo. It was taken from the San Jacinto Monument up above the battlefield. And you can see the at this time, you can see where the daughters of the Texas Revolution were already planting trees to, because, hey, it's a park, right? you got to plant trees. Um, and you can also tell that it was very closely mown. Um, we do have these things like diaries. You can't read this, but this is from Dr. Nicholas Labadee, who was in, who was in the fight. And he describes uh, finding the enemy taking shelter in... Uh, an island of timber about 400 yards from the road towards the marsh. Uh, we stood there three-fourths of an hour trying to get a shot at them as they lay in the grass. So just from that one sentence from one single diary, you get a whole idea of what the heck the place looked like. <clears throat> and then here's an up, here's an up close uh, picture of that, one of the battle maps. You can see it just shows the, the marsh area, and I've actually overlain topographic, one foot topographic or two foot topographic uh, lines on this map. It talks about low areas. It talks where the Mexican camp is. You can see where the trees are, the timber. Um, you don't see it on this map, but it's, there's a, it says prairie out in these bare open areas. Um, this is what the overall map looks like. And then we have photos taken from the monument. Everybody gets up into the monument and they snap photographs, right? So, and I'm sorry if I'm blocking somebody. Um, but this is from uh, the 1940s. And you can see these lines here. This is where they were closely mowing it. They, were, they would mow this thing about six times a year. Not recommended for prairie management, if you're wondering. And you can see things like this group of trees right here. This group of trees is along Boggy Bayou. There's a little bayou that runs through here, a little dip. Those, that group of trees is on the 1836 battle maps, whereas none of these trees are. And when you go into this group of trees, it's cedar elm, post oak, that's about it. A couple junipers, no live oaks, no loblolly pine, no Arizona ash, the stuff everybody plants out there. When you look at these trees, there's an old road that used to follow uh, through here. You can still kind of see the scar of the roadway. They pulled it up uh, after the, before this photo was taken, but you can see where they planted rows of trees along that road. So basically all of these trees, some of them are volunteers, but a lot of them were planted, whereas these clumps of trees here and here are all natural. And you can tell by the species composition and by their location. Um, here's the 1930 photo. What I wanted to show is you can see in that photo, this clump of trees is the same as this clump you see in this photo taken from the monument. These two clump of tree, clumps of trees are on the battle map. When you go into those little mots, they're things like post oak. There's no post oak anywhere else. It tells you that when the folks talked about islands of trees and they show those islands of trees on their maps, those are, and those are old, old post oaks, you know that, okay, I'm getting an idea now that the monument, the battleground was essentially tree free except for these little islands and riparian areas. Here's an old photo uh, taken from the monument while this pool was still being, the reflection pool was being constructed. You see this, here's the ship channel. This is Carpenter's Bayou. It's this meandering bayou with bald cypress along it, pine forest on either side, open prairie. That clump of trees is that one right there. Um, this is unrecognizable today because of subsidence and development. Here's Houston where all the black smoke is. There's downtown Houston. Um, but you're looking out towards Houston. This is the Pine Woods where Beltway 8 crosses and the old uh, Army Ammunition Depot used to be. Uh, about half of these pines are clear. The other half, when you go over the Beltway going north, you'll see, the, see a pine forest on your right. That forest has always been there. It's, it's because of the sandy soil that 
relatively sandy soil that lies there. Whereas all this area here is just open prairie. There's some other photos looking towards Deer Park, and it's just prairie as far as you can see. Um, and that little clump of trees there is, is this one right here. So we have a really good idea of what the heck this site used to look like. And of course, we have reference prairies as well we can look at, like at Brazos Bend. So if we're in, these are that higher sandy soils along these old river channel scars. We know what kind of prairie exists in these areas. Um, you see little pimple mounds all over, uh, wetlands. So we have a good, here's Mima Mounds out near West Bay. You know, we know what the vegetation should be. We know what's left. We kind of know what we need to add to it. Adding it is the really hard part. The first thing we did in the 80s, we started uh, not mowing it six times a year. We went to mowing it twice a year. TxDOT would do that for us. Um, and sure enough, this is long spike tridents. Sure enough, this is from 1990. Some native prairie popped up when we, when we quit mowing it so, so often. Um, most of the site, though, was uh, Cherokee sedge, which is a native sedge which doesn't mind being, being mown, as well as mead sedge, Carex medii, which is actually pretty rare but apparently enjoys being mown six times a year. Uh, but the tall grasses and flowers were very, very sparse. And unlike a lot of sites that had been grazed, this site, because it had been mown so tremendously, we, had a, we still have a very good uh, flowering plant diversity, especially annual flowers, whereas that's been lost at a lot of our other prairie remnant sites. So this site has lost a whole different suite of species than most of our other remnants have because of the past management. But with the tech stop mowing, we had problems. The contractors would mow whenever they wanted to. It came out in October 2011. Do you all remember 2011? We got nine inches of rain by October for the entire year, and they mowed it down short. Right as those grasses, they, have, they were suffering from the drought, and they stuck their inflorescences up trying to make some seed, and then they got mown. That's like the worst thing you could ever do. And I just said, I quit, you know, and I went up to Austin, and I complained to David, and he said, we're buying a tractor. So we bought a tractor and a shredder, 15-foot shredder. And we're, now we're making the park folks mow it. They don't like it, but we get them to do it. And they're coming along as time goes by. Uh, we mow it now in April and then after Thanksgiving, whenever we can. Unless we're going to burn a unit, then we do not mow it at all. Uh, which <clears throat> we did have... Uh, in area diamond shamrock donated 100 acres uh, to us and um uh, where is it all this prairie out here a good actually this piece here was donated to us 100 acres by diamond shamrock it's prairie in this photo but by the time we got it it had been 20 foot 30 foot tall tallow forest for about 20 years uh, going on 30 years. So we chipped the tallow. We had to do a very extensive archaeological survey because this is a battlefield. Even though we're using a seed drill which goes in about this deep, the archaeologist said, we got to look for stuff, you know, because we don't want, they thought we were going to plow it up, you know, they didn't, you know, and destroy the art of the, but we didn't. At any rate, we harvested seed off of the Dick Benoit Prairie in Galveston County. Uh, Native American seed came down and did that for us. Uh, it was a very excellent harvest, over 120 species in it. Um, we drilled it in, and this is me. I cut off my head. I'm not a very good photographer. But you can see it came up quite well. <clears throat> we mowed it as often as we could. Um, in this kind of clay soil where it's really wet, uh, you, you may or may not need to worry about cover crops. We didn't have to. Uh, we really were worried about getting it mown often enough. Uh, if you don't, if we didn't mow it frequently enough, it would just be like ragweed. And as I found, when you completely shade that seed bit out, your seed does not germinate very well. I found that out the hard way. I thought some we would make a good cover crop at Sheldon. We didn't mow an area. We just mowed our fire breaks. It only looks good in our fire breaks where we mowed it. The rest of the area was a disaster. 
So this is what it looked like after two years. Um, I love this photo. It's at sunset. It's beautiful. You see this long spike tridens. What you don't know is that about 60% of the site is basey grass. So a real lesson learned there, you've got to get rid of your basey grass before you go and seed an area. Uh, plateau is a pre-emergent. If you use plateau, it will get rid of your basey grass. It will get rid of the seedling basey grass that comes up. You, you've got to wait about a year before you can seed into it because it also kills past palums and really hurts panicums as well. Um, Meanwhile, in the remnant prairie, the area we didn't see, the area that had been that did not become a tallow forest, that had been being, being mowed by six years, we only we went to mowing it less often. In between mowings, and when we we would actually, this is two years without mowing, we wanted to burn the site. Oh my God, you know, they had been mowing these little trees for 50 years that had been popping up. And so you have these stumps that are about this big and about that tall, and they just sprout up every year. Mowing does not kill trees. You can mow them a gazillion times, and it's not going to kill a pecan. It's not going to kill a, a oak. It's not going to kill an ash tree. They're just going to keep sprouting up. So we decided to go ahead and burn it. Um, and you cannot believe the visitor feedback from this. I was going to be hard and feathered um, but we applied herbicide we burned it our happy burn crew this is actually from Galveston but yay fire and uh, this is what it looked like afterwards and all these awesome annuals started popping up after the burn and um, it just started looking this is that picture I took with all the brush and weed this is the same spot it's just like Fire is like magic when it comes to prairie management. It's, it's the closest thing to magic you will ever see. Um, so this is at post burn. This is some really cool people. Uh, Wendy, <laughs> my, my daughter. Um, Spiranthes, uh, stuff I don't know. Oh, Little Blue popping up, Gamma Grass, uh, Coreopsis in the background. Uh, it's just... The results from the fire and the changed mowing schedule, it's just fantastic. It's just awesome, beyond belief. Um, uh, it's difficult to tell, but this little kind of orangey looking stuff here is all butterfly weed. Asclepius tuberosa. So believe it or not, anywhere you had those old channel scars, a little bit of loamy soil, a little bit of... of uh, Wetness on the drier areas, we've had butterfly weed pop up. In the wetter areas, we've had the ladies' tresses pop up. So this site is just fantastic. I don't know of anywhere this far east, this close to the coast, where you have species like the butterfly weed. I'm going to get to that. It's the next slide. So um, blue sage. So bottom line is it's just a fantastic looking site we are missing some species especially the tall grasses unlike a lot of areas hey little blue stem here is actually quite rare because it's because of that mo that management history of it the unique management history uh, a lot of times when you have grazed areas shredded areas they look nothing you have nothing but little blue stem and you do, you lack a lot of the forbs this site is just the opposite um Trying to think if there's something else I wanted to say. Uh, it's just an awesome place to visit, especially uh, shortly after after one of our fires. And and look, if we can burn San Jacinto Monument, have you all been to the monument? It's surrounded by development. It's got a highway on one side. It's got a ship channel. It's got refineries. You cannot ever have a fire escape. You cannot put smoke across the ship channel. I mean, can you imagine if, I, if we caused a tanker to collide with a barge or something? But we have the confidence to know that we can burn that area. And the local industries and the local fire departments have all been brought on board. That first, you know, why do I have these people here all smiling? Because this was a, an incredible feat to get this site burned. If we can burn this site, you can burn any site. I can't think of one that we, is, would be, have more difficulty burning than, than this area here.
a few months, just a few months. Um, so the area here has subsided about 10 feet. Um, <clears throat> this is the 1930 photo. Here's a photo from the monument. You see this water in the background, this road going across. This area right here is this open water area you see in this photograph here. All of this became open water because of 10 feet of subsidence. A lot of the prairie was lost. The marsh was totally lost to open water. And uh, we had a company that came in just a, a few years ago. They were dredging a dock about nine miles down the ship channel at, at uh, Bayport. They were actually excavating dry ground to make a new dock. And uh, they loaded that dirt onto a barge, brought it upstream, um, pumped the mud out of that barge into the subsided. You see this dead tree here standing in the water. That used to actually be that some of that boggy bayou riparian forest that the Mexicans were hiding in um, uh, had been converted to deep open water by subsidence. So we pumped it full of mud, and now it is back to being marsh again. Of course, the marsh is much bigger than it was historically, but at least it's marsh instead of just open water. Which, uh, this is the area that the Mexicans were driven into, uh, the Mexican army was driven into. They thought they could cross it on their horses. They were unfamiliar with salt marshes. These guys were coming up from down south, right, where it's all the Laguna Madre sand. You know, you could actually bring a horse through water, not here. So they got stuck into the mud and were picked off. And it is a um, essentially a battlefield cemetery. So prior to doing this, the Mexican consulate, uh, the bishop came and had a wreath-laying ceremony to dedicate it as a, a graveyard. And then we were allowed to do our our work. And it was very successful. And that's it. So, we.